in the vastness of Greek mythology, where both gods and mortals each played their role, one name shone brighter than most, a name that whispered through generations, a name that carved itself into the annals of heroism, Perseus. His saga was not merely a tale, it was an odyssey that echoed across the ages, captivating the hearts of storytellers and dreamers alike. Our tale begins in the ancient kingdom of Argos, where King Acrisius ruled with a heart divided by ambition and dread. Acrisius was the son of King Abbas and Queen Aglio of Argos. He was a scion of royal blood, who inherited the throne of Argos from his father, King Abbas. Yet his reign was marred by the specter of rivalry and a chilling prophecy that set the wheels of fate into motion. From the moment Acrisius drew his first breath, fate entwined him with a twin brother Proetus. Their paths were destined to diverge, their bond torn asunder by ambition and the desperate struggle for power. With Abbas's last breath, Acrisius seized the throne, forcing Proetus into exile to quell any threat to his reign. But destiny is a capricious mistress, and exile led Proetus to the distant land of Lycia, where a love bloomed against the backdrop of war. Proetus found solace and love in the arms of Sthenabuea, the radiant daughter of King Iobates. Their union forged alliances, sparking a war that would echo across the Aegean. The clash of swords and the cries of soldiers reverberated as two brothers fought for control of their ancestral kingdom. But the war's crescendo left them at an impasse and a decision emerged from the chaos. The realm would be divided. Thus, the kingdom of Argos was cleaved in two. Prudus ruled from the fortified city of Tyrins, while Acrisius held sway within the walls of Argos. Peace reigned, but the sinister machinations of fate would not relent. In the heart of Argos, Acrisius longed for an heir to secure his legacy. He turned his gaze to the radiant figure of Eurydice, daughter of King Lacedaemon and Queen Sparta, a union that honored love and lineage. Acrisius and Eurydice's union bore fruit, a daughter named Danae. But Acrisius, driven by the fires of ambition and the foreboding prophecy that cast a shadow upon his dreams, yearned for a male heir. Desperation led Acrisius to the sacred oracle of Delphi, where Pythia's cryptic words pierced the air like an ominous dirge. The prophecy unveiled a haunting truth. Acrisius's demise would come at the hands of his own blood, his own grandson, a progeny born of his beloved daughter, Danae. As the winds of prophecy whispered through the halls of Argos, Acrisius's desires shifted. The quest for a male heir morphed into a relentless determination to thwart the birth of his fateful grandson. Fear and determination melded in his heart, and a plan began to take shape. A plan that would set forth a series of events that would carve their names into the annals of mythology. In the ancient kingdom of Argos, Acrisius returned from the Oracle of Delphi with more than just a heavy heart. He carried with him the weight of a prophecy that hung over his kingdom, like a shroud of impending doom. The Oracle's words echoed through his mind, an ominous reminder that fate could be both a ruthless tyrant and an inescapable destiny. As Acrisius stood upon his kingdom's soil, the air was thick with a tension that could not be dispelled. The oracle's whispers, as if carried by the wind itself, filled his ears. A grandson born of his own blood would be the architect of his downfall. The prophecy was a chilling gust that extinguished any lingering warmth of hope or ambition, leaving behind an icy trail of apprehension. Caught in the crossfire of his own conflicting emotions, Acrisius was a man at war with himself. The specter of a future paved with his own blood haunted him relentlessly a stark reminder of the fragility of power and the unyielding grasp of fate. Yet, buried beneath layers of fear, a defiant ember burned within him. He refused to be a pawn in the hands of destiny, to let his lineage be marred by the prophecies that hung over him like a dark cloud. With a resolve that burned as bright as the forging fires of the gods, Acrisius transformed his turmoil into action. The seeds of fear had taken root, but he was determined to unearth them before they could grow into a forest of despair. He would rise against destiny itself, sculpting the path of fate into one of his own design, a path that would defy the very stars that foretold his doom.
Thus, Acrisus' desperation and cunning collided to shape a plan as towering and unyielding as the walls of his fortress. In a symphony of bronze and stone, he erected a prison that would confine his own flesh and blood, his daughter Danai, the living embodiment of the ominous prophecy. Within those stone walls, she became both captive and pawn, a pawn in his ruthless game against the hands that guided the threads of fate. The fortress's walls gleamed with a cold, metallic sheen, a reflection of Acrisius' iron-willed determination. His eyes blazed with an unshakable purpose, to outwit the gods themselves, to master his own destiny in the face of their cosmic power. The fortress was a bastion of defiance, a testament to the lengths a man would go to wrest control from the hands of the divine. In the heart of Argos, a father's desperate act and a daughter's captivity ignited a chain of events that would reverberate through history. The towering fortress reached for the heavens, standing tall against the backdrop of the kingdom's skyline. It became a symbol of mortal tenacity against the whims of an unforgiving fate, and within its shadowed embrace, Danae's life became tied to the prophecy, intertwining her destiny with those of gods and heroes. But fate, as it often does, weaves its own tapestries, disregarding the designs of mortals. And so, as the prophecy specter loomed large, it was Zeus, the king of gods, who decided to challenge the very tower Acrisius had built. The heavens themselves would bend to his will as he cast aside his divine form, shrouding himself in a cascade of golden rain, a radiant descent that would forever alter the course of Danai's life. Intricately manipulating the fabric of the cosmos, Zeus chose a guise that would capture not just Danai's gaze, but her heart. A cascade of golden light that tumbled from the celestial heavens to caress the mortal realm. The brilliance of his divine transformation seeped through the tower's roof, bathing Danae in a glow that transcended mortal comprehension. She lay there, bathed in a torrent of ethereal luminescence, an unwitting recipient of the god's enchanting presence. In that moment, the boundaries between the realms dissolved, time itself bowing to the whims of divine desire. Danae's senses danced to the rhythm of the cosmos as Zeus bestowed upon her a gift both breathtaking and life-altering, the seed of life, the essence of his very godhood. It was a union beyond the carnal, a merging of the mortal and the divine, a symphony of power and love that played out beneath the luminous canopy. As the golden radiance retreated, Danai found herself forever changed, cradling a secret too profound to comprehend, the seed of Zeus himself, a divine ember that had ignited the spark of life within her mortal womb. Zeus had intervened, and the dance between God and mortal had set into motion a destiny that would change the very fabric of mythology itself. For this meeting of Danai and Zeus ensured that Danai fell pregnant, and with time Danai gave birth to a son, the one and only Perseus. But fate, relentless and unforgiving, refused to be bent even by Acrisius' desperate defiance. When Danai gave birth to a grandson, Acrisius found himself caught in the snare of an implacable truth. The walls of his fortress may have been impenetrable, but the realm of the gods operated beyond the confines of mortal design. Whispers of skepticism floated through the air, speculations that it was not the gods, but perhaps his own brother, Protus, who had sown the seeds of Danai's pregnancy. Acrisius stood on the precipice of destiny, a man gripped by a chilling dilemma that echoed through the corridors of his mind. To slay his own flesh and blood, his grandson, was to risk invoking the wrath of the very gods he sought to outwit. But to let Perseus grow, to nurture him into a man, was to tempt the prophecy that a future lay where his own blood would stain his hands. In the echoing chambers of his palace, Acrisius wrestled with the scales of destiny, his heart heavy with a decision that carried the weight of both the present and the yet to be. It was a battle between his fear of the god's retribution and his desperation to control his own fate. And in that struggle, a grim realization crystallized. He had but one path left to tread. With a heart burdened by the inevitability of his choice, Acrisius embarked on an act that would send ripples across the seas of time. He crafted a chest its wood sturdy and its frame large enough to cradle both his daughter and his grandson. 
into this vessel of fate, he placed Danai and Perseus, binding their destinies to the mercy of the open sea. And with the silent benediction of despair, he cast the chest adrift, relinquishing them to the vast embrace of the waves. The sea, ever the mistress of uncertainty, held the chest in its grasp. Acrisius watched the horizon with a heart that battled grief and resolve in equal measure. He knew not whether the waves would embrace the chest with a gentle cradle or deliver a fate far more ominous. As the chest dwindled into a speck on the horizon, he clung to the fragile hope that the gods, perhaps, would be merciful. Acrisius's reasoning was as desperate as it was shrewd, the logic of a man ensnared in the intricate dance between divinity and human will. He cast his hopes to the fickle winds, wagering the lives of his own blood against the whims of gods. Yet destiny's currents were far from finished with Danai and Perseus. From the lofty heights of Mount Olympus, Zeus gazed upon his lover and the son they had born together, a child of both divine and mortal lineage. The father of gods could not remain a mere observer, for his heart was entwined with the lives of those he had touched. And so, with a silent plea that resonated through the heavens, Zeus called upon Poseidon. The waves of Poseidon's realm responded to the divine command, and as if guided by the hand of fate itself, the chest that bore Danai and Perseus navigated the treacherous sea unscathed. It was on the sun-kissed shores of Seraphos, a tranquil island embraced by the Adjure waters, that their journey found its destination. A humble fisherman, Dictes, cast his eyes upon the chest that fate had bequeathed to his care. With reverence and awe, he pried open the lid, revealing the treasures hidden within, a mother and her son, refugees of destiny. Danai's beauty was as radiant as the sun that kissed the waves, and young Perseus, the child of gods, grew under the nurturing hands of a mortal. The passage of years etched tales of resilience upon Danai's face, her spirit untamed by the tumultuous tides she had weathered. The island of Seriphos embraced them as its own, and Dictes became a steadfast presence in their lives, a beacon of kindness in a world often marred by shadows. The island's rhythm echoed in Perseus's heart, transforming him from a boy into a man whose strength matched the very sea that had delivered him to these shores. But fate, it seemed, could not be swayed by the tranquil days that unfolded. King Polydectes, ruler of Seraphos, was a man ensnared by his desires, his sight set upon Danai as the jewel he coveted. Yet Danai's heart remained steadfast, her love reserved for the son she had nurtured with unwavering devotion. The king's desire morphed into obsession, casting a dark cloud over Danai's sanctuary. Polydectes knew that as long as Perseus was in the picture, he could not force himself upon Danai, for Perseus was now strong enough to protect his mother. But Polydectes, a master manipulator, concocted a plan to rid himself of the formidable obstacle that Perseus posed. Like a puppeteer pulling the strings of destiny, he crafted the tale of his impending marriage to a woman named Hippodamia, a tale that masked his true intentions beneath a veneer of celebration. The king's proclamation held a sinister caveat. He required an extravagant wedding gift, the likes of which only legends dared to dream. In the dimly lit chambers of the palace, Polydectes revealed his scheme to Perseus. He painted a picture of devotion to Hippodamia, an amour that could only be consummated once a fitting tribute graced their union. And what tribute could suffice for such a grand occasion? The head of Medusa, the gorgon whose gaze could freeze hearts in an eternal, stony embrace. The words hung in the air, laden with both challenge and danger. Persis's heart quickened, his mind a whirlwind of conflicting thoughts. For in Polydectes' insidious proposal, a glimmer of hope danced. It was an opportunity to secure his mother's freedom from the king's sinister desires. Perseus accepted the challenge, for he saw a chance to reshape their destiny, to forge a path where they could escape the clutches of a kingdom fraught with deceit. Polydectes, however, was no fool. He crafted his words with calculated precision, knowing that his manipulation had led Perseus into a trap. He believed the quest for Medusa's head to be a fool's errand, a death sentence cloaked in the guise of glory. And Perseus, 
driven by a potent mix of love and determination, had walked right into the king's snare. Yet Perseus was a child of both a mortal and a god. He was no pawn to be manipulated. The call of adventure echoed in his veins, mingling with the blood of Olympus. With each heartbeat, his resolve grew stronger, a blazing determination to confront the impossible and redefine the narrative that fate had woven. Perseus, driven by a force more potent than fear, accepted this seemingly insurmountable quest. The burden of success rested upon his shoulders, as did the doubts of the skeptical king who had orchestrated this perilous path. For Medusa's lair was shrouded in mystery, a puzzle that seemed to defy even the gods knowing. Yet from the heights of Mount Olympus, the deities of old cast their watchful gaze upon the unfolding drama. Athena, the wise and fierce goddess, and Hermes, the swift messenger, descended from their divine abode to bestow their blessings upon Perseus. They saw in him the spark of resilience and valor that could reshape destiny. Guiding Perseus to the Garden of the Hesperides, Athena gifted him a shield that was no ordinary piece of armor. Its surface gleamed like a polished mirror, and in its reflection lay a potent magic, a safeguard against the lethal gaze of Medusa. Beside the shield, Athena bestowed upon him a satchel of wondrous design, a vessel in which the severed head of the Gorgon could be contained without peril. Though Athena had already punished Medusa by transforming her into a Gorgon, she still sought to punish Medusa further by aiding in Medusa's demise. Hermes, the fleet-footed messenger of the gods, was not to be outdone. He placed upon Perseus's feet a pair of winged sandals, allowing him to soar through the skies with the grace of a bird, escaping danger and reaching the unreachable. And in his hand, Hermes placed an adamantine sword, a blade of celestial craftsmanship, capable of slicing through the most formidable of foes. Yet the greatest gift of all was one that bridged the realms of life and death. Perseus was bestowed with Hades' own helmet of darkness, an artifact of immense power that had played a pivotal role in the defeat of the Titans. With its dark magic, Perseus could become as intangible as a shadow, turning invisible and slipping past the vigilant eyes of his adversaries. Armed with the blessings of the divine and the artifacts of legends, Perseus stood on the precipice of destiny. The, the journey ahead would be fraught with challenges, but the very gods themselves had cast their lot with him, a mortal who dared to challenge the impossible. In the clash between the mortal and the monstrous, the stage was set for a tale that would resonate through the ages, a tale of heroism, sacrifice, and the indomitable spirit that defied even the harshest of odds. As Perseus stood before these divine patrons, his fate entwined with theirs. He wondered why the gods withheld the knowledge of Medusa's whereabouts. However, the gods, in their wisdom, understood that the journey was as important as the destination. They recognized that mere knowledge of the Gorgon's lair would not suffice to mold Perseus into a true hero. The quest required wit, determination, resourcefulness adaptability and the ability to navigate treacherous waters. By withholding the specific location, the gods aimed to light the fire within Perseus and forge his character through trials that would shape him into a legend. Perseus, a mortal marked by the gods for an extraordinary mission, set his course towards the realm of the Greia. The Greia were sisters of Medusa and the Gorgons, and the daughters of the ancient sea deities Phorcys and Cedo. They were as intertwined with the fates as the very threads of life themselves. They were no ordinary beings, for they shared a single eye and a single tooth among them. However, the wisdom Perseus sought was not to be granted freely. The Greia, like the riddles of the cosmos, guarded their secrets with tenacity. The hero's path was no leisurely stroll. It demanded audacity and resolve. To wrest the knowledge from the grasp of these sisters, Perseus employed a tactic both daring and unconventional. In a moment of calculated boldness, Perseus took possession of their soul eye, plunging these sisters of the shadows into temporary darkness. The sightless Greia, now at the mercy of a mortal who dared confront their cryptic existence, felt the weight of their own enigma bear down upon them. Perseus, relentless in his pursuit of truth, 
wielded the eye as a bargaining chip, a beacon of hope in a realm ruled by secrecy. And in that pivotal moment, the sisters' resolve wavered, their hold on their guarded knowledge slipped through their ephemeral fingers. Bound by the desperate need to regain their sight, the Grey Eye relented. Their voices, like echoes from the abyss, revealed the coveted information Perseus sought. The location of Medusa's lair. The Gorgon's realm was unveiled through the faltering words of the Grey Eye, uttered in exchange for the return of their stolen eye. Perseus, now armed with the elusive knowledge he had won, ventured forth once more, his destiny inching ever closer to its fateful intersection with the monstrous Gorgon. Armed with the coveted knowledge of Medusa's lair, Perseus embarked on a daring flight, propelled by the mystical wings gifted to him by the fleet-footed Hermes. The very air itself seemed to bend to his will as he soared toward his perilous destination, a cave concealed within the heart of a foreboding landscape. The entrance to Medusa's domain loomed before him, a mouth yawning into the depths of the earth, a gateway to a realm where monstrous secrets lay in wait. Perseus knew that silence was his ally. The slightest disturbance might awaken not just the fearsome Gorgon he sought, but her sisters as well, a trio of horrors that could spell his doom. With the grace of a shadow, Perseus ventured into the cavern, the darkness embracing him like an old friend. The path ahead was fraught with peril, each step laden with the weight of his quest. But Perseus possessed the tools of divinity, a shield that mirrored the world around him and winged sandals that lifted him above the ground, leaving no trace of his passage. Through the twisting passages and eerie silence, Perseus finally caught sight of his quarry, Medusa, her serpentine tresses hissing like vipers in the gloom. The hero's heart raced, his determination unwavering. As he advanced, shield held high to avoid the petrifying gaze that had claimed countless lives. And then, in a breathless moment, the adamantine sword that had once been a titan's weapon cleaved through the air with a precision honed by fate itself. Perseus's strike was true, a single stroke that severed the monstrous head from its serpentine neck. The cavern trembled as Medusa's baleful existence came to an end her death a cataclysmic release of dark energy. Time seemed to hold its breath as Perseus moved swiftly, guided by the wisdom of Athena. The Gorgon's severed head, a trophy as gruesome as it was powerful, was cradled in the Divine Satchel, a vessel that contained the essence of death itself. But as Medusa's lifeblood ebbed away, the slumbering sisters Euryale and Stheno awoken. The realm of nightmares seemed to stir with their awakening, threatening to ensnare the intruder who dared trespass upon their domain. Upon seeing their fallen sister, their screams echoed through the cave, shattering the stone statues of the many victims. Yet, the god's gifts proved their worth once more. With the helmet of darkness shrouding him from the sister's view, and the winged sandals carrying him on air's gentle breath, Perseus slipped away from the cave's maw, his triumph shadowed by the echoing hiss of serpent hair and the cold, unrelenting stare of the Gorgons. However, that would not be the end of Medusa's lineage. The very moment the Gorgon's head parted from her body, a remarkable transformation began, for Medusa's blood held within it a unique and unexpected magic. As the blood of the Gorgon splattered upon the earth, a wondrous and enigmatic alchemy unfolded. From the very essence of Medusa's life, two distinct and extraordinary beings were born. First, there emerged Chrysir, a figure of mythic splendor. He rose from the soil like a manifestation of the Earth's hidden treasures, a being radiant with divine qualities. Chrysir emerged fully grown and armed, his form a testament to the strange and potent mix of mortal and otherworldly essence. With his birth, the world witnessed the birth of a hero, a figure of strength and power whose very presence seemed to resonate with the echoes of forgotten legends. From the very same drops of blood that had given rise to him, a second marvel emerged, an equine creature of such grace and wonder that it seemed as if a dream had come to life. This creature was Pegasus, a winged horse of unparalleled beauty and majesty. Pegasus's wings, bathed in the essence of Medusa's magic, bore him aloft with an ethereal grace, carrying him through the skies with the freedom of the wind itself. 
Having accomplished his gruesome mission, Perseus found himself far from the sanctuary of his home. The journey back, fraught with trials and unforeseen encounters, promised its own odyssey of challenges. In the heart of Ethiopia, a realm drenched in golden sunsets and crashing waves, a monstrous shadow loomed over the land, a terror born of divine retribution. King Cepheus ruled this land, a kingdom thriving with vibrant life, until the recklessness of his queen Cassiopeia kindled a wrath beyond mortal comprehension. Cassiopeia's words laden with hubris dared to elevate her own beauty above the daughters of Nereus, the sea's ancient deities. Her audacious claims sparked a storm of resentment among the Nereids, ethereal nymphs of the watery depths. Their indignant voices echoed through the realms, reaching the ears of Poseidon, the sea god himself. His response was swift and merciless, the unleashed fury of the Ethiopian Cetus. This monstrous sea beast, a manifestation of Poseidon's ire, unleashed chaos upon the land. Ethiopia's serenity was shattered, and its very survival hinged on a horrifying choice. King Cepheus was faced with an unthinkable ultimatum. To save his kingdom, he must sacrifice his own daughter Andromeda to the ravenous maw of the Cetus. Desperation gripped the king's heart, and he sought any means to escape this cruel fate. Yet, as he scoured the heavens for answers, the haunting truth remained. Only the blood of a princess could sate the monstrous appetite of the sea. As the sun cast its final rays across the land, Perseus soared high above Ethiopia on the winged sandals gifted by Hermes. His gaze pierced the horizon, and there, against the backdrop of crashing waves and looming darkness, he beheld a sight that would forever alter his destiny. Chained to a desolate sea rock, the innocent Andromeda stood as a living offering to the Satis, a sacrifice to appease the sea's vengeful appetite, Yet, fate had other plans in store. With the legendary head of Medusa cradled in his hands, Perseus descended upon the scene, a savior cloaked in divine purpose. As the Gorgon's serpentine gaze met the monstrous Cetus, an otherworldly transformation unfolded. The very sea that once birthed the terror now claimed it, turning the creature to stone, an eternal monument to its own malevolence. The power of Medusa, even in death, wielded dominion over the depths, with the Satis's curse broken, the land of Ethiopia breathed a sigh of relief. The hero Perseus had not only saved a kingdom, but also unlocked the shackles that bound Andromeda to her impending doom. A bond forged in the crucible of adversity united them, and a destiny entwined by the threads of myth and fate set their course. Yet, even in triumph, new challenges emerged. The union of Perseus and Andromeda, destined to bring joy to Ethiopia, stirred the tempestuous waters of rivalry. Phineas, the promised suitor of Andromeda, harbored a heart consumed by jealousy. At a lavish wedding feast, emotions ignited into a fiery confrontation as Phineas and his followers sought to sever the ties between bride and groom. But Perseus, whose prowess and cunning knew no bounds, wielded the head of Medusa as a weapon of divine justice. With the Gorgon's head unleashed once more, the very essence of life turned to stone before his eyes. Phineas's treacherous scheme crumbled to dust, his followers immobilized in a stony tableau of their own making. Leaving the sun-drenched shores of Ethiopia behind, Perseus and Andromeda embarked on a new chapter of their saga, a journey bound for Seraphos. As they soared through the skies, the blood of Medusa, once a force of terror, found new purpose as droplets of blood fell into the Red Sea and the Sahara's sands. From this blood emerged the Red Sea's vibrant corals and Sahara's slithering serpents. The road back to Seraphos was a path both familiar and transformed. Perseus, the bearer of the Gorgon's head, bore witness to the landscapes changed by their mythical journey. Yet, his return to the island he once called home was met with an unforeseen twist. The shadows of betrayal cast by Polydectes, the opportunistic ruler. In Perseus's absence, Polydectes had seized the opportunity to lay claim to Danae's hand in marriage, exploiting the hero's noble absence. This audacious move was a spark igniting a blaze of wrath within Perseus. With Medusa's head as his instrument, he breached the palace walls, 
unleashing the petrifying power of the Gorgon's gaze upon the treacherous king and his retinue. The palace, once a realm of intrigue and deceit, was transformed into a gallery of stone, a testament to the fate that befalls those who dare to manipulate the threads of destiny. The people of Seraphos gazed upon the petrified figures, marveling at the tale they now stood witness to, the tale of Perseus, a hero who wielded the very embodiment of fear itself. With the chapter of revenge concluded, Perseus's gaze turned skyward, his thoughts reaching towards the pantheon of gods who had guided and shaped his journey. Gratitude and responsibility intertwined, compelling him to return the divine gifts bestowed upon him. Yet Athena, goddess of wisdom and battle strategy, found a special place for the fearsome visage of Medusa. Incorporating it into her ages, her legendary shield, she forged an emblem of both offense and defense, a symbol of her divine might and an eternal link to the valiant hero who had defied fate itself. After the whirlwind of adventures and trials, Perseus's tale did not end with his heroic feats. With Dictys now reigning as the king of Seriphus, Perseus, Andromeda, and Danae set their sights on a new chapter, their return to Argos. The chasm that Acrisius had sought to widen between himself and his grandson had now shrunk, fate drawing them closer together once more. Haunted by the weight of the oracle's foreboding prophecy, Perseus embarked on a journey to reconcile with the very figure whose shadow had loomed over his lineage, Acrisius, his grandfather. But fate's game is a wily one, and Acrisius, the king of Argos, had vanished into the obscure folds of the Pelasgian land, as if seeking refuge from the looming doom prophesied years ago. The irony was almost palpable as Perseus arrived in Argos, only to find an empty throne and the ghostly echoes of a kingdom abandoned. Undeterred, Perseus set his sights on Larissa, a place where the rhythmic pounding of athletes' hearts and the roar of the crowd created a vibrant pulse in the air. King Tutamides held athletic games in honor of his deceased father, a spectacle where heroes and contenders sought to etch their names into history. Perseus, no stranger to competition, joined the fray. In the midst of the games, fate's hand reached out once more. As Perseus threw a discus with skill and force, it struck an unexpected target, an old man, frail against the tides of time. In an instant, the cheers of the crowd turned to hushed gasps as life's thread was abruptly severed. The truth, unveiled in a flash of revelation, was as chilling as it was inevitable. The old man, struck down by the errant discus, was none other than Acrisius himself. The prophecy that had cast its long shadow over Perseus's journey had been fulfilled, a twist of fate both haunting and poignant. In that moment, amidst the shock and the silence, the grand saga of Perseus came full circle. The hero who had defied gods, vanquished monsters, and shaped his own destiny now stood face to face with the legacy of his lineage. Though the prophecy had been fulfilled, Perseus rejected the throne of Argos, believing it was not right to benefit from the death of his grandfather, which he unintentionally caused. Perseus arranged an exchange of kingdoms with his cousin and son of Proetus, Megapenthes. Megapenthes would rule as the King of Argos, while Perseus ruled as the king of Tyrans and Medea. He sought to forge his own kingdom, one of his own making. He breathed life into a new city, Mycenae, whose foundations would echo with his name through the annals of time. As the years flowed on, Mycenae flourished under the stewardship of Perseus, a monument to his vision and resilience. Amid its walls, Perseus and Andromeda built a life together, one blessed with the laughter and cries of their children nine in all, seven sons and two daughters, who carried forth their legacy, each a note in the symphony of their lineage. Perseus later became the ancestor to many Greek figures, such as Heracles, Helen of Troy, and the Dioscuri, Castor and Polydeuces. The tale of Perseus, a hero who defied gods and destiny alike, came full circle within the walls of Mycenae, the echoes of his exploits reverberated through the ages, an enduring testament to the indomitable spirit that shaped the course of his life. And as the winds of time swept through the realm he forged, Perseus's legacy endured, 
etched in stone, story, and the very fabric of myth itself.